Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 77. I'm Steve Kwan. I'm Matt Kwan. And we have a very special guest with us here today. We have Seb Lavoie, one of my longtime training partners. Seb, you want to say hi? Hi, guys. <laughs> so apologies in advance if the audio quality isn't up to regular snuff. We're recording with Zoom here. It was uh, the best way to get all of us on remotely. But I think the content is going to be valuable enough that you'll forgive a slight dip in the quality. So, Seb, probably you're the best person to introduce and explain your background. Why don't you go ahead and tell everyone who you are and what you do? Yeah, Roger that. So my name is Seb Lavoie. I'm uh, an RCMP member um, in E-Division, so here in British Columbia. I have been for the last uh, almost 20 years. I started, uh, I was hired in Montreal, as you can tell, because I can't speak English or French or none of the two official languages. <laughs> um, I, actually, I actually moved here uh, to Tofino, which was my first posting as an RCMP member. And I eventually moved on to the Air Carrier Protective Program after um, 9-11. Spent a, f a few years there, and then I uh, moved on to the Lower Mainland Emergency Response Team. Uh, I was on the team for 12, almost 13 years, seven years as a team leader, two years as an overall team leader, and I am currently the Sergeant Major for the division uh, in E here, so in, in the Pacific region. So I, I'm responsible for BC as a Sergeant Major. You're high up, basically. For an NCO, I'm okay. <laughs> and also for those who are interested, uh, Seb is also my conditioning coach and uh, taught me a lot about lifting and stuff. So that's also a side note. He is in very good superhero physique shape. Yeah, <laughs> Seb, your, your Facebook is kind of depressing sometimes because I see you doing these crazy box jumps and I think, man, that's, that looks very challenging. Yeah, it's funny. The older I get, the least impressive my box jumps are. <laughs> <laughs> so we wanted to have a law enforcement expert on the podcast for quite a while because this is something that Matt and I are not really equipped to handle ourselves. And with law enforcement being so closely entwined with jujitsu in terms of the number of people who train it, it's been something that's been on the docket for a long time. But given current events, we wanted to really expedite this and talk about this. Now, I think everyone knows this. We record this podcast uh, weeks in advance. We're going to try and get it out the door early. We're not going to try to anchor this onto any particular current event because it'll be out of date by the time it goes out the door. But I think that it might be good to have just a general philosophical discussion with someone who is both very experienced at martial arts, specifically jujitsu, and also very experienced at law enforcement. Yep. That sounds, that sounds great. Yeah. So, uh, Seb, wh why don't you, uh, first of all, just tell us, why did you get into law enforcement in the first place? Uh, there's quite a, you know, there's a, there's a few angles to that, um, to that question, but, um, I was the, the kid that had, um, a very strong sense of, of, of justice. And, and I know some people eyeballs will go straight up when I say that, but the reality is, is I was, um, I was an empath. Um, you know, I, I, I felt sort of people's pain and, and, um, and I, I, I despised bullies, um, growing up, uh, mainly because I was bullied and, <laughs> and that's kind of me a too. common theme. <laughs> it's kind of a common theme, but, um, you know, I, I, for me, it was more about making a stand and, and, and one of the sort of culminating point for me was during the biker war between the rock machine, the hell's angels, uh, in Quebec. Uh, and for, you know, most of your listeners, this will be probably before they were even born, but, um, but, uh, there was, uh, you know, a nasty war going on between the rock machine, the hell's angels, which are two organized crime groups. And, um, and, uh, one day I was coming back from school and I was in the, I was in the school bus and mom was with me. We we're on a field trip type deal. And, and all of a sudden I see, you know, these, these bikers on the ground with their sort of 
handcuffed behind the back and 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 on top of them or you know sort of securing the scene is 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 SWAT guys and this was a a unit from the Montreal police called Wolverine and they had SWAT guys in there and I asked my mom I said who are these guys they were wearing balaclavas they they looked like they were in shape you know there was just there was just a lot of uh, intrigue there for a, a little boy so I asked mom and mom said you know what those guys are not scared everybody else is and she kind of painted it to be you know um the stand to make type deal for me as a young boy. So from that day on, I, I never actually changed my course. Um, my bearing was always on law enforcement, but my bearing was always specifically on tactical operation. And, uh, and that's what happened. Cool. So you were inspired by seeing some bad guys getting taken down and, and some badass SWAT guys uh, dealing with them. And you were inspired from seeing that, that plus being bullied and wanting to, instill justice into today's society. Yeah, absolutely. And and I mean, you have to kind of understand the context, right? Like this is at a time where the biker war between the rock machine, and the hell's angels yielded some extremely catastrophic blows to the community, right? We're talking about a, an eight year old that was killed in a bombing of a, of a Jeep. Um, God forbid, I forgot his name now, but, um, but also there were, you know, uh, murders. I mean, it was murder galore. Like bodies were dropping left, right, and center, and a lot of people caught in the crossfires. A lot of family members um, killed, ripped apart. Uh, it just was a super nasty time. And when I mean nasty, for most of the people in BC or for, for people around the world, uh, the Montreal chapter of the of the Hell's Angels was. According to Sony Barger, who's the creator of the Hells Angels, was one of the most dangerous and treacherous chapter to be around. So this is a, you know, it, it's not empty words. Like these guys were extremely dangerous under the guidance of Mom Boucher, and um, and people were dying left, right, and center. So everybody was absolutely terrified, and cops were no different. They were getting beatings, roadside daily. Like you know, mm -hmm. it, it was really bad. It was really bad. So yeah, making a stand was a thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and uh, and being a you know you've been practicing martial arts for what probably like fifteen years, maybe even longer, and not just jujitsu, but also uh, I know you have a background in kickboxing as well, right? Yeah, so I've been I've I've been my I've been put through martial arts since I was three. So I'm 43. So it's been 40 years. But on that, I can't say that I was 40 years serious because, you know, the first, right. <laughs> 10, the first 10 or 12 years um, you weren't all that serious. And there were tr some traditional martial arts in there that were really good for my discipline and, and sort of get mm -hmm. me going in life. And, but it wasn't, um, you know, perhaps the best defensive um, you know, tools that I could be provided, but it still did the trick. And I ended up in Muay Thai and I ended up, uh, I ended up uh, in karate initially in karate initially in Kung Fu initially, you know, that's how many people chuckle, but yeah, it was Chinese boxing really. And then I evolved, um, to Muay Thai and I spent many years in Muay Thai. When I got tired of getting hit in the face, I, uh, I started jujitsu. So in 2007 started jujitsu with the West coast crew and, been here sort of ever since. So let me ask you a question, Sam. Mm -hmm. When it comes to jujitsu, there's mm -hmm. kind of this romantic sales pitch for jujitsu that oh, all law enforcement officers should do jujitsu because it's such a great art for de-escalation. And mm -hmm. I mean, to some extent, that's true, right? I personally got into jujitsu because out of all of the martial arts that I researched when I was looking for something to do, philosophically, jujitsu aligned the most with my personal interests, which is, look, I don't want to hurt anybody. I just want to defend myself. But something I've always wondered mm -hmm. is, from a law enforcement perspective, how true is that? Like, is jujitsu something that really is usable on a daily basis for you guys? And if so, are there any changes or customizations that you need to make in the real world that we wouldn't do in the gym. Mm -hmm. l let me sort of qualify that a bit. Like for me, um, the best fight you can get into in policing is the fight you don't get into, right? So there is a variety of different things that come into play long before you're going hands-on, long before you use your jiu-jitsu. And, and having the gift of the gab, having the ability to speak to people, having the ability to de-escalate that way is, is, is a primary concern, right? Because you could be the toughest guy around, but if every time you show off on a call, 
fight starts, I don't want you nowhere near my call, right? So, so, so there, there's a variety of different skills and, and there's also tools and there's also uh, tactical principles that are implemented, you know, at the training or wherever it is that you train. So whether it's in depot or, or at the JI Institute or wherever your agency is, your basic training, you are going to learn some tactics. And, and those tactics, if they're implemented correctly, should push back the need for use of force. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's obviously inevitable. Right. And so if you've taken the vast majority of the encounters out because you're actually someone that's truly capable of de-escalating, then what's left is what have you been training? Right. So I would say this. All fights starts on the start standing up. So if it, if it is a case of me having to test the waters because somebody is already placed under arrest and I'm acting in lawful authority and I and I go in to see what the compliance level is, um, I'm going to go standing up. So uh, my hands are going to be, you know, in a semi-guarded position where I'm, I'm, I'm coming in and, uh, and I have to test the waters. Well, what that means, that means that if fists are being thrown, I have to be able to, to shield and cover and, and, and bob and weave and, and potentially uh, throw one back. I may have to switch level if I want to take this to the ground and I may have to, to switch level or, or to use either judo or some wrestling if I have to. And, and when I say wrestling, I don't mean wrestling where you drive your, necessarily drive your head in a mat because there's no mats. You're on the concrete or wherever you are. Um, but you have to have the ability. You have to be more of a generalist, right? You have to have the ability to protect yourself standing up. You have to have the ability, if, if your goal is to take it to the ground, to restrain mobility and to have the ability to continue scanning your surroundings for additional threats, then perhaps you're going to have to, you're going to take that fight to the ground. And if you take it to the ground, what do we know works best on the ground? Jiu-Jitsu, no questions. So for me, if I was to quantify the perfect combo, I would say you need to have a decent stand up, you need to have good takedown strategies and you need to be great on the ground or good on the ground at the very least. And have you used jujitsu a lot in your career as a law enforcement officer? I wouldn't say a lot because I was somebody that thankfully actually could speak to people. And, and I had a rule and I always, I always obeyed by that rule, which was if it's good enough for my mom, it's good enough to be said. Right. So I always I had a rule where I would um, I and a rule that I would implement the crisis de-escalation techniques that I was taught. And, and some of those that were innate just because I, I have decent negotiator, I suppose. And um, and I would do that. And so the majority of the time I didn't have to. But it, but there were instances um, either on patrol. I was in a remote location by myself and people if I'm the only thing between a man a man's freedom, and uh, then, you know, sometimes the fight was on. And yes, I used my jiu-jitsu, and, and, and it, you know, it worked out perfectly. Um, wh while on the team, jiu-jitsu worked out very good, too. Uh, entering strongholds where we had some real, you know, um, some real criminals, some real dangerous ones. Um, you know, I, I've, I've used my jiu-jitsu over the years uh, quite a few times. And, um, and, and, and it's good because there's, there's never been sort of a, an excessive force complaint on me. I've never, and I can say this, and I mean, you know, um, you guys have known me for many, many, many years. There's a lot of things I did wrong in my career. A lot of things I made mistakes on. I have never once in my career in 20 years used of excessive force. Never had to, ever. Uh, and I don't think there is a had to anyways, but, but I just never did. So that's something that I'm extremely proud of. But yeah, I did use my jiu-jitsu. I, I just got a real like jiu-jitsu guy question for you there, Seb. Have, yep. have you yep. ever had to use your guard in, on your job? Like use, your, no. use a form of guard off your back? No, negative. Never had to. Have you ever had to argue with the perp about whether your takedown scored two points or whether it was actually a guard? <laughs> <laughs> That's two. <laughs> you know, however this call ends, just know that I scored two points on you. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, let, let me ask a question. Have you ever been in a situation where you did have to use jujitsu and you realized, holy moly, this other guy also knows jujitsu? <laughs> I'm yeah. curious to know if that ever happens. 
No. So what happened to me was um, actually it was it, thankfully, and I say thankfully, and you'll understand why in a second, <laughs> is uh, he was a wrestler and I was a jujitsu guy. So we end up, he's facing away and he's running away and I, they, were broken into, they were breaking into cars and when I was in Tofino on the island. And anyway, long story short, they're obviously stealing from the cars and I run after him and, and he doesn't turn back towards me. So I end up, you know, in a bit of a tackle and, and I end up on top right away. So there wasn't that, you know, had this been the, the reverse scenario where I didn't, ha- I didn't necessarily have the element of surprise. I necessarily didn't have an angle, uh, uh, you know, a, um, a favorable angle. This could have been a different story. Maybe I would have been taken down and, and maybe now I would have had to use my guard, but no, thankfully I, I, I did the, uh, you know, cops are not paid, uh, are not paid to fight. We're paid to win. Right. That's a very different mindset. Yeah. Well, let me ask another question here, tying into that. I mean, again, total area of my ignorance here, but I've heard um, various statements that you've got to like modify your jujitsu if you're a police officer, because obviously, I mean, if you have a sidearm strapped to your side, (laughs) you know, you have to be at least peripherally aware of where the other guy's hands are. So you can't just go and like, you know, snap on a, a choke or a headlock and completely leave your firearm exposed. So I'm wondering, are there any customizations or tweaks that as a police officer, you have to be aware of due to considerations like that? Yeah, I mean, retention of, of, of weapons, especially of firearms, is, is extremely critical. Because this thing comes out of there, my friend, it's game over, right? So uh, it's, it's about having that, the awareness. And, and, and I don't know that there is a, a major change in my jiu-jitsu when I, when I wear my duty belt. I mean, there's certain things that you can't really do because it's just awkward. And, you know, especially uh, when I was on the team with the drop holsters and everything, it was actually worse than on patrol. Um, but I would say that I think it might be a little bit overstated. Like we've, we've done all kinds of testing and I know a lot of people have, and I'm not pretending to be an expert, but I was you know, teaching use of force for many years. And, and we did all kinds of testing where we would roll and have some actual all out rolls and try to gain control is sometimes two on one, sometimes three on one, sometimes two perps on one cop. And I mean, <laughs> the reality is, is my jujitsu didn't change that much. What did change is where sort of my, my position of advantages, right? So I would always try to be on the top where I like to play from the guard. So I would play on my back sometimes, and, um, but not when I did that because those are not the positions that you want to be in on the streets. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, there's, also, there's also, you cannot be tunnel vision. So you can't be in an all-out sort of jiu-jitsu you know, match and consider that you're one-on-one. You're never one-on-one on the streets, yeah. in front of the bars, in, in a house somewhere, in a, in, a, in a back alley or whatever the case may be. So there's some additional things that, you know, weapon retention, always a consideration. Scanning the environment, always a, a, a consideration. Where are my exit routes? You know, always considerations. And there's a bunch of other tactical considerations that I won't get into, and obviously just for the sake of not sort of exposing them all. But, but there's a lot of tactical variations. Aside from that, I, I, you know, I use my jujitsu as I would. So what, um, you know, what, how would you consider the average police officer? Like at what belt level do you think they are in terms of understanding grappling or just controlling, uh, somebody else's resisting body? I would say, um, and I, I can only speak for, for us at, at uh, Depo, so I can only speak for sort of RCMP members. Um, I would say that when they come out of, of the academy, I would say they're probably a two stripes white, is what I would say. Mm-hmm. And so that is, that's considering somebody that has no background whatsoever, that goes in, and I would say by the time they're done, they're probably a two if they're really, really good at learning, they might be a three stripes because you, you have to understand they're going for six months. They're training every day, right? right. Every day. And sometimes multiple sessions a day. And um, the instructors there, especially the police defensive tactics cadre, um, you know, a couple of them are black belts and solid black belts and, and own clubs in town and that kind of stuff. And, and they're cops too. Uh, but, um, but I would say the issue isn't so much their capacity once they come out of the academy there the issue is two years later type deal right Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. but i would also say in all fairness um that members are training a lot more than they used to there is you know various movements that encourage it um, and it's quite 
apparent that there is a need for it. And it's also been accepted as an organization, which is a big change from when I initially joined. When I joined, the thought process was, if you train in jiu-jitsu as a cop, you automatically will be more prone to use violence. When we know mm -hmm. this to be the complete opposite, the more confident yes. you are, you don't need to be proving anything to anybody. And with that, there's also a stress inoculation piece, which is critical because you're already dealing with stressful incidents. If you add to that the stress of a physical conflict, you have problems, you know? Mm -hmm. so, so I would say that the current trend now, there's a lot more members that are training than ever before. I would say over the last two or three years. Yeah. And, and what, what would you, uh, if you were to be in charge of, you know, police training, like I'm, I'm, a, I'm assuming that you would make jujitsu kind of a mandatory part of, uh, training because we can all see how it's excellent for de-escalation and understanding how to break down, uh, and control, uh, and subdue, uh, you know, a, a suspect, but, um, what level in terms of belt level, do you think that the average police officer should have as a minimum? So I would say um, around the blue belt coming out of training, ideally, and I would say probably ideal around the mid purple type range, right? And the reason why that is, is because you're basically motor a ninja skills. at that point. <laughs> <laughs> your, your, your motor skills are, are taking a hit during stressful situations, right? And uh, mm -hmm. you, need, you need to look no further than, um, than tournaments for that, right? You see guys that are at higher levels and they compete and the games all of a sudden is really, really simple. And, and they don't, per perhaps they're not even using the game that you see them use all the time in the gym in a, in a stress-free environment. So if I was to say to you, um, now you're arresting this person who's wanted for armed robbery or whatever the case may be, uh, just imagine the stress level, there's potentially weapons involved, there's potentially, you know, you don't know any of that because you don't know, you haven't searched that person yet. So imagine if you're a blue belt and you, you get involved in a physical conflict in the course of your duties, you're likely to be a white belt, right? Mm -hmm. More so, you know, more or less. But if you're a purple belt, you're likely to be a blue belt. And that is generally sufficient for most people that we deal with. Well, let me ask a follow-up question to that because um, is, is it possible that you could actually overtrain jujitsu? I mean, for example, if you are a black belt, then you've obviously invested a significant amount of your time and energy in jujitsu. And is that possibly going to put you to the point where you kind of have blinders on at that point and you view the world through a jujitsu lens. I mean, I, I know that I have been guilty of this where I get so conditioned to what is effectively a safe fight that if something goes wrong, it catches me by surprise. And I, I find this a lot and said, you, maybe you've had this experience where, you know, if I'm rolling with a brown or a black belt, I know there's no risk to me. But if I'm rolling with a white belt, um, if I let my guard down, they might elbow me in the face. Right? And I'm, I'm not used to that because you're not supposed to do that. And is it possible that you can overtrain in an art that is relatively safe to the, to the detriment of your other training as a police officer? My answer to this would be no. I don't, th I don't think that you can overtrain jiu-jitsu, um, you know, for a variety of reasons. Then it goes into uh, the prevention of occupational stress injury. It goes to preventing PTSD to be an offset. It, it goes to the hormone fluctuation in police officers as a result of their duties and the stress levels, cortisol, and a variety of different hormones that are consistently, and adrenaline, obviously, that are consistently fluctuating. So I would say no. But what I would say to that is th that has to be a complement to your police training. So you can't just be training in the dojo and be like, okay, we're, you know, I'm good to go. There has to be some scenario-based training. There has to be, and the scenario-based training has to be real, realistic scenario-based training. Where are you conducting it? Is it a hard surface? Is it with your tools on? Is it, you know, uh, in the dark? Because, you know, Murphy's Law, if anything bad happens to a police officer, it happens in a bad time. It never happens at a good time, you know? And, 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 and so it's more about how, how you train the rest of the time. The answer would be yes, if you don't actually train in the other modalities. So if you're somebody that doesn't get put through uh, use of force, like consistent use of force training, if you're someone that doesn't, 
if you're someone that doesn't uh, train scenario-based training, if you're someone that doesn't get to test your stuff in, in a variety of different environments, including staircases and houses and, and small apartments and closets and whatever, then yes. But it's having the ability to use those transferable skills into um, uh, an, another training environment that is complementary, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Is, is there any moves? I mean, I, I understand that training, first of all, training in Canada is probably very different from training in the States, but mm-hmm. also different States down South probably all have different training methods and, and different standards and things like that. Uh, is there moves or techniques that you were told are not to be used on the job? Well, <laughs> It's it's quite timely that you ask that because a lot of the the vascular the neck the vascular restraint or the neck or carotid control as we call it in the RCMP um, are highly controversial, right? And right. and again, it, I'm not completely opposed to the controversy around those techniques. And the reason is, if you take somebody that's a white belt or you take somebody that doesn't even do jujitsu regularly, that last training was in the academy and they now applying a vascular neck restraint or some sort of karate control or whatever um how much under under a body foot full of adrenaline in a highly stressful situation how much force is actually applied to that carotid artery Mm -hmm. and can that create some uh, what is it referred to again this um there's a carotid um where the carotid actually basically ruptures yeah, I actually know someone that did that, and he had like a minor stroke overnight. I heard about yes, that. Yes, it's called carotid. What is it called again? I had it on the tip of my tongue, and it and it slipped out. But the artery ruptures, and then there's yeah, all basically, different types basic, of basically issues. you have a resi- basically you have a resisting person, and you're applying the choke. You're under stressful conditions. You're likely using more force than you would want to because you have adrenaline flowing in your body. And if you're not stress inoculated, and if you're not used to the amount of pressure you put on those chokes, there is a chance that you can cause a, a fatal rupture. And, and what is the, so in the RCMP, for, in the RCMP, for example, this would be the equivalent of dealing with basically a, a, a threat to death grip of body arm. So basically if, if you were justified to use your firearm, but you can't for a variety of tactical reasons, then you can use the carotid control is basically what it falls into. So it's mm-hmm. a very high level of force. But, uh, but say, for example, just to illustrate this, if, you know, in a world where Steve is bludgeoning uh, you, Matt, you know, being on top and punching you down. Man, I'd love to live in that world. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is fiction, clearly. Yeah. But yeah. If, this hap- <laughs> if this happened, um, and I roll up as a, as a police officer, I roll to scene and I see you like hitting Matt in the face and Matt's head is against concrete and obviously is sustaining some incredible damage and any more blows could mean the difference between life and death. I may not be in a position or it may not be safe for me to deploy uh, my pistol. You know, like obviously you two are in, uh, sort of tangled together and everything. So I may decide to go for carotid control. Uh, on that. So now I've, I've read today, I believe today, maybe the commissioner was discussing the reviewing of that, um, of that technique. And quite frankly, in 20 years of policing, I've never used it. Mm-hmm. But back in the days when the old, the old dogs are talking, that's all they did. They choked everybody. And, and, but, it's, but it's very simple. The choke is very primal right? Grabbing somebody by the throat is the first thing that somebody that has no defensive tactics will do. Yeah. It's, it's very primal. This is a survival instinct. It's innate to humans. So to me, all that did is cooperate the fact that they had no training, right? So it's, it wasn't like, oh, you know, they used to use this and it was very effective. So I would love to. No, it just confirms that training wasn't where it needs to be or where, where it needed to be rather. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny you mention that because Matt and I, I think just a while ago, we're talking about this on the podcast and we were talking about how, you know, as someone who has been training for a long time, when I think of, you know, what kind of submissions could be done to me, mm-hmm. I would much rather have someone put me in a chokehold than have me like put me in a twister or even an arm lock, right? Because mm-hmm. I 
am experienced in those situations. Um, but that said, if you rewind the clock and you think of what it felt like when you were a white belt, it's a very different experience when someone chokes you, right? When you're mm -hmm. a, a high ranking experienced jujitsu person, when someone puts you in a choke, that's just business as usual. You know, to relax, you know how to escape, you know, not to freak out. But on the other hand, if you are a white belt and you've never had someone try to choke you, you got to be careful because that person could, you know, to escape the choke, they might jerk around, they might freak out, they might hurt themselves in the process. So it's a tricky one because on one hand, can a choke be done safely? I mean, yeah, I think on you, know, you see this enough in jujitsu to see that there's some evidence of it, but also that's a very different situation from a police encounter, especially against someone who's untrained. And to your point, the optics of a choke like I can fully understand how someone who doesn't train would look at a choke and say, man, we don't want to be doing that at all. Right. It's completely understandable from the untrained eye. And there's, there's another part that you didn't touch on there, Steve. And that's when we're in the dojo doing jujitsu um, and there's a choke applied. You also have the option to tap out and the choke is immediately released. Whereas that's right. If you're, you're, you know, using this choke on a suspect, uh, there is no tapping out. You know, there's it's very high, highly likely that this person might continue to struggle until injury happens or, you know, like, God forbid, Seb mentioned, uh, like a ruptured uh, carotid artery or something serious. So there's no option to for the perpetrator to tap out and the cops say, okay, like, I'll, I'll let you go now. You know, that's and that's where I think that things like lever control and understanding uh, isolating a single lever and, and things like that become a lot more efficient and safe. Yeah, I mean, if, if I'm using a carotid control technique on someone that's, you know, pausing a, a, a serious threat to somebody else's life, uh, they're going to sleep, period. Yeah. Right. Like it, it's just, I think that's an, that's an assumption that we, that we can make and it's understanding how long can the per, can the choke be held after the person is, so quote unquote unconscious, right? So it's not, again, this is <laughs> 15 seconds makes a big difference on an unconscious person if you have a choco. So if you are to use that, and I qualify this against somebody that poses a threat of death of grievous bodily arm, uh, there is no tapping out. If they, if they tap out and you're, you're, you're at the point where you're so confident and you are so sort of, um, detached and you have the ability to think straight, then yeah, perhaps I will release it and keep it in place so that they cannot escape because they could also tap out. I mean, everybody that trains for a week knows how to tap. And what happens if you tap? People release. Is that bad muscle memory? Well, it is. If, you, if you're trying to control a dangerous suspect and he goes and taps, yeah. right? So now what? Do you release fully? Because if you do that, guess what? There is no tapping in this. So you, you just capitalize on that, right? There's also, the, there's also the portion where potentially the person could be playing possum. And I know people will be like, oh, you know, like that's unlikely. But actually it is likely. Like, it, it does happen. And some, some career criminals are training these techniques in prison as well. So, I mean, it, it's, not like, um, it's, it's not like it's out of the realm of possibility. So, yeah. For sure. Not the ideal and it's called carotid dissection, by the way. It just got back to me. But uh, yeah, and, carotid and, dissection. and it happens sometime in training where, you know, even just in a jujitsu context, you know, forget law enforcement for a second, where you will, mm -hmm. you get so used to looking after your training partners that as soon as there's even like a hint of a tap, you let go. And actually, that's bit me in the ass a few times um, in competition where I felt somebody tap, but you know, I was wrong and they didn't tap. And as soon as you let it go, they, you know, they take advantage of the situation and it's, and, and you realize that as the levels get higher and as you know, your opponents get tougher and tougher and they don't want to tap that you actually have to train to put people to sleep. You have to train to actually break someone's, you know, limb to, to actually get a tap because a lot of these guys in, in high level tournaments don't want to tap. So if you're not expecting them to really take some for the submission to go into a, a big range of motion, then you might prematurely let them out of the hold and the match doesn't end. And I imagine that that could be something that could be looked out for as well uh, as a law enforcement officer. 
Yeah, I mean, it, 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 that would that has a potential to be deadly, right? And it, we're and with that, we're not mentioning a variety of other threat factors, right? We're not mentioning the fact that the person is likely on PCP or meth or something crazy like that with subhuman strength and having the ability to sustain either damage or be uh, pain compliant, be completely useless. Um, this obviously isn't a pain compliant technique, but still, I mean, there is a variety of different factors that that make this a lot more challenging with that. There's also the addition of the fact that the person perhaps has weapons in their waistband or they may have something on them that you don't know about because you haven't searched them yet. Like there's a variety of different uh, threat factors. And with that, there also could be somebody coming out of the bar. That's a friend, a friendly, right? So so you don't have all day to kind of make things happen, right? Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up because one of the things that I've always wondered about jujitsu is, you know, we train in what is effectively a very safe environment. When you're sparring with someone, the whole goal is actually not to hurt that person. Like that's really your first and foremost goal above and beyond all else. And it has always made me wonder, like, man, if I ever had to actually defend myself, like if I got someone in an arm bar, would I actually be able to bring myself to break the person's arm? I don't think I would. Yes, um, I would. And, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I would. but, you know, and on a conversely, when we think about chokes, we're used to an environment where the person taps immediately and that you just go back to normal. But yeah, I mean, if you've ever been one in, in one of those situations where you choke someone and you can't see the reaction and they don't tap and they pass out and then they start convulsing it's freaky <laughs> like it it is really really freaky and that makes you kind of wonder when you go into a real world situation how much of the mindset really changes in that situation because yeah said to your point you cannot rely on the tap you cannot rely on a trained response from another person who understands how to grapple because they probably don't. Yeah, absolutely. And then I would say to that, Steve, and this was something that was very close to my heart when I was on the team and making sure that our, our, our guys were very well versed in this is basically when do you switch from controlling a suspect to caring for them? Right. And that's clearly that's mm -hmm. that's critically important. And 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 for me, once the job is done, this is like solving a mathematical equation. There is no feelings, there is no emotion. I solve a problem. Once the problem is solved, which means that the, the suspect is in handcuffed and safe, and I've cleared, you know, their person of weapons or whatever, waistband, at least in the immediate area, then I'm a caregiver. So if you're applying a carotid control and the person goes into convulsion, you have a priority here in the priorities of life. And that priority is to get that person handcuffed quickly. But you know that they also could potentially be in medical distress. So you have to have that in the back of your mind. So those cuffs need to go on real quick. And once they go on, then you're off the body and then you're, you know, search, you're searching, doing whatever, putting him in a recovery position, whatever it needs. And if there is a need for additional medical um, treatment, then you have to be prepared and willing to do that. So there could be a need for CPR, there could be a need for, you know, whatever the case may be, especially if they're, if they're high on drugs, or if they're, they've taken something and they're out of control. Um, you have to have the ability to quickly gain control so that you can quickly switch roles. Yeah. So, I mean, all of that makes perfect sense. And I think it raises a lot of questions that are very relevant to where we are at today. Now, I know that a lot of listeners come back and listen to our episodes back in time, but right now we're right in the middle of the George Floyd protests that are happening in the States and they've become a very much a worldwide thing. Even here in Vancouver, we've had protests and we're a completely different country. So really a nerve has been touched. And so much of that centers around the police. And I know that the police have a nearly impossible job. I mean, I kind of liken it to being like the goalkeeper, right? Your job, if everything is going right, then people don't even know you're there. But if something goes wrong, then everyone's on top of you, right? And it's, it's very much like that situation where the goalie, you know, is just completely silent and forgotten until he makes a mistake or something that goes wrong and then everyone just rags on them. So we're in the middle of some very challenging discussions right now worldwide about how to provide the best quality police service while also holding people accountable when they cross the line. And Seb, I mean, I don't personally know anyone who would be more equipped to talk about this subject than you. Yeah, and I guess I guess we can qualify that by saying that A, I'm black, uh, and B, I'm a police officer. 
Um, hey, hey, sorry. For for the record, everyone in this in this conversation is a person of color. If we're being truthful, that is correct. That is correct. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's just so everyone knows. <laughs> so, what's happening in the states right now is 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 extremely disheartening. Extremely disheartening. Um, it's affected um, not only our people in our communities it, it it's affecting uh, police officers in canada and and i just i believe that there is quite a marked difference between the two between canadian police and us police and for a variety of reasons and i can qualif qualify that a little bit later but but i think that it's affected canadian police officers um, very very deeply having issues of um, of family members turning on them and having friends turning on them and we're talking about lifelong friends and family members that are so disgusted with the actions of the what was his name a chaplain or Kevin Chauvin. Chauvin yeah 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 is it Kevin Chauvin I, I don't Kevin know his, his name I try to I try to forget his face and remember the other one but um, but but the reality is um, the events that transpired in in the U.S. were tragic. There, there is there is no there is no question there. there I, I believe that, and I'm very careful in in addressing use of force um, issues because sometimes what you see isn't what what it is, and you don't have the totality of the circumstances, and it's very easy to jump to conclusion, and 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 you could, um, you know crucify someone in the court of public opinion uh, for something that they actually were justified to do. This is in the case. This is a, this is a pretty, a pretty evident uh, faux pas that uh, cost a man his life. But it's, yeah. I believe it's, it's, it's a, I don't want to call it a byproduct, but it is a, uh, it's a symptom of, of an issue that's been long lingering. Right. So uh, yeah. Anyways, it's, it, it's been tough. Very tough. Yeah. What was your What was your reaction when you know you you heard of that or the first time that you saw that footage? You saw the the suspect, you know, in a in an unathletic position, fully controlled by also three other men, and then uh, he, you know, he's he's crying out, he's calling for his mom, he's saying, "I can't breathe," and the uh, you know that switch that you talked about earlier in the conversation where you go from a law enforcer to a caregiver just never really happened and uh, you know clearly um, neglectful behavior uh, on on the you know from from Chauvin and just not never making that switch to uh, realizing that that you know its situation appears to be under control and now that um, and now you know this is where we are. So what, what was your, what was your reaction when you first saw that video? Well, first of all, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm an empath. So, um, I was, I was heartbroken. I was heartbroken when I saw the video. Um, it's, it's very, very difficult to watch. I, I watched it once only and that was enough. Um, you know, it's interesting what I pick on. Um, there's some of the stuff I, I picked on watching the video, but, uh, being a, a, a sort of an experienced police officer, there's a lot of things sort of the video spoke volume to me on a, on a variety of different fronts. And, um, and I would say that a, obviously aside from the obvious, which is the positioning was completely off. The, the weight was completely on the neck, which is completely unacceptable. His neck was in a very compromising position. He was yeah. in handcuff. There didn't see Seem to be a search procedure going on or anything like that. I mean, it wouldn't have excused the, the the knee on the neck, but perhaps that was as a result of being in a highly stressful situation, which I knew nothing about the background of the call. So I was, you know, it was one of those. It was one of those that I didn't have enough information, but what I did see was clear and obvious that those are things that we wouldn't do, that we're not supposed to do, that no police department that I know of is is trained to do. What I did see as well was. Um, almost like a um, socially dysfunctional human standing on top of another one. Like he appeared to be in sort of a, in a, on a throne or something, you know, he appeared to be in a position of power. Oh, like totally. His, just, his posture was, it looked like he had, his, had it almost his hand in his pocket. Like he was kind of like, mm -hmm. cause there were people, the people that where the footage came from, they were screaming, Hey, he's saying he can't breathe and and get off him and all that stuff. But if they do anything, you know, then they're just as they're just as culpable there. So uh, I, I do agree that the positioning of Chauvin was not only careless but almost uh, almost like he was showing off or or you know 
completely. Conf- yeah, and no. what's interesting, and what's interesting with that, Matt, is um, is is that you mentioned that because when I looked at the footage, the other thing I noticed was three numpties that didn't obviously interject or do anything. But when I looked at the look on their faces, the first thought that came to mind for me was those are recruits. They're and, rookies, and, and they were, were they not? Like they were the, it was their yes. first day, was it not yes. for two of them? No, I, I think they had three months on the job or something oh, okay. like that. Okay. So, so it doesn't excuse the behavior by a long shot, because yeah. if you're a human that can stand for this at three months of service, my friend, we have problems, yeah. Yeah. right? But I will say this, if you have an alpha male, you know, not he was, because clearly if he was, he wouldn't have had to posture that way, but. But if, he, if he's leading the pack and he's in charge of training them, they inherently will have sort of a, uh, they, they become the, sort of the peons, right? And they may be, you know, it, maybe that's how it's done. Like, I don't know. I haven't been on the road long enough. I haven't been in a physical conflict. And, uh, and, and maybe that's the position he's supposed to be in. He's a use of force instructor. And I don't know if he is. I'm just making, you know, I'm just making this up. But th- there's enough there for people that are coming in without prior experience to not interject. Mm-hmm. Are they guilty? No question. Unquestionably, they are. So, you know, the whole thing was a, a, a giant, um, you know, tragedy. Like, it, 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 it was, and it was an avoidable tragedy, and it makes it even more of a tragedy because it was avoidable, you know? Anyways, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, that's kind of what I, yeah. you know, because uh, now we have two, two coroner's reports. One of them says, yes, he w- was strangled. And then the other one says he had a heart attack uh, mm-hmm. and said that his, um, I don't know the term of the heart. Uh, I don't know if it was the aorta or whatever, but there was significant blockage regardless. W- you know, even if that situation did happen and he started having a heart attack or whatever, you know, the, the cop didn't do any favors by just maintaining the same positioning. Uh, if, if he took it a little bit, you know, as someone who trained jujitsu, if you take your, your knee off somebody's, uh, if you get into that position, you have your knee on their back or whatever, and then you take it off slightly, uh, and you feel, you feel that the, the person's really not struggling as much as they once were, and maybe something's going on. Do you not just say, okay, hold on, that switch needs to happen now. Now we need to talk about uh, you know, this person is now possibly in trouble health wise, and we need to now apply some care rather than, you know, going full steam ahead on the, uh, you know, controlling them. like, um, so regardless of whether it was a heart attack, you know, the, there's no reason why that, that force needed to be applied there. And it, it may, it may not have, it may actually not have, uh, saved George Floyd's life either at that point. Yeah, I mean, you know, may not or will not or should not or we don't know, right? Because we've seen what we've seen. And I mean, if if he goes in medical distress because he has a pre-existing condition and he has taken some substance, it's sad, but it's is doing, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, for me, it's just it's just a matter of 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 um there is no real rationalizing w- w- what happened there, really. I mean, I don't understand. I would have to talk to Chauvin and 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 kind of, you know, say, "Hey, man, like, what were you thinking when when this kind of went pear shape?" And 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 I don't think that anything he could say would change my mind in, at this point, and it wouldn't. Mm-hmm. Um, but but I think um, at the very least, it would give us some insight as to what his frame of mind was, right? Mm-hmm. Um, with that. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned the two autopsies there, Matt, and I just wanted to qualify that because, you know, I, I've heard a lot of criticism like, oh, well, you know, that's pretty clear. The the first uh, pathologist was working with the police and the second one was working for the family. Exactly. They well, both bolster the opinions of, yeah. of the, the, the person that they're representing, right? Sure, but here's 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 the here's where the, the sort of the caveat is. You you have a, a pathologist, and the pathologist, and as part of their sort of their code of ethics, their job is to be impartial. Like their job is, and so I have never I've 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 been through probably twelve autopsies here in Canada. Not not all for murders, but some for murders and some from other horrible sort of deaths. Um, 
And if there, at, at no point in that autopsy did the pathologist ask Seb Lavoie, like, hey, man, you know, what do you think happened? Can you give, give me a little bit of circumstances that I'm going to go over? And, and, you know, sort of for me to kind of influence the outcome, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does. So, and, and they're putting their entire career on the line. You need to understand that. Like, if they're making stuff up, why would a pathologist do this on account of a bad cop that knowing full well that when the report comes out, the city will be aflame. The, you know, there is huge repercussions for that pathologist to come out and say that for the sake of what on account of protecting one bad cop. Are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't believe that to be the case, but what I do believe, and, and then we see consistently divergence of opinion in the pathologist report. Now with that, if you were to speak to the other side of the coin, uh, now you have a family that has a class action lawsuit, obviously, they're going to be, and so is that pathologist ethically sound, right? The question has to be asked. So what I would say, and what I think you'll see is you'll probably see a third one come in there and be sort of the, the deciding, you know, the, the, he'll corroborate one way or another. And that's reasonable to me to do that. Um, and I think it's not unusual. So people see Machiavellic things into there. I don't see that. What I do see is it's not unusual for pathologists to, to come to different conclusions. Those things are not black and white. When you open the person up, there isn't a little you know, piece of paper that says this is what happened. It's a deduction, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and sometimes uh, things go missed or things are you know, um, not that obvious. So yeah, I just, you know, just wanted to chat about that a bit. I guess what I'm wondering is, you know, if, if, at what point do you start to get actually physical with someone like that? Is it only once they show aggression towards you or is there a certain point where, you know, they do the whole limp body thing and they don't want to cooperate when you actually have to start to, to use force and, and, you know, detain them? You know, that's actually like a very... <laughs> Um, it's a very complex question. It's a complex, it's a simple question, but it's a complex answer. I mean, it, it depends on a variety of different factors. It depends on the totality of the circumstances. It, de it depends of where you are. It depends of what time, of, what time of the day or night it is. It depends the environment, who else is there, how many friendlies, who, where's your backup? Like what's your, what are your abilities to, to deal with, with him by yourself? What is, what is your, the connection you're establishing with him? Are you going anywhere when you're trying to, you know, there's a variety of different things. But what we do know is once the person have established the grounds to arrest and that an arrest has been verbalized. So I've, I've told him, like, listen, you, you are under arrest for whatever the, the reason is, if tactically feasible, because if it isn't and we're, you know, there's there's a variety of dynamic circumstances occurring and I don't have time to tell him, then, then you know, not ideal, but it may happen that way. Uh, but generally in a case like this, especially if we're talking about, and I don't know the nature of the call, I'm not going to make stuff up, but, um, it, you know, it, there is so many factors that influence how quickly or how slowly you're going to go hands on with something. Someone. How much time do you have to have that conversation roadside? Is there keys in the ignition? Can the person depart with the, the mm -hmm. wheels? Uh, is there is there areas of the wheels that you haven't cleared? Are there pistols in there? Like you know, like can the person reach? There's a variety of different things that will dictate how quickly or how slowly I will go hands on. I would go hands on with someone. Mm -hmm. And do you? This is going to be also a question that's kind of rhetorical. There's there's really no answer. But if you do you think if if Chauvin had trained uh, a grappling art like jiu-jitsu and was, was aware of that, do you think that there's a good chance that uh, George Floyd would still be alive today? No, I do not. I think what we have here is a sociopath. And, and, and of course, you know, I, I'm not a mental health professional, but um, I think there are deep-rooted deep issues uh, with, this, with this guy to have to be without compassion in light of the circumstances, mm -hmm. uh, to hear Buddy call his mom, to see him pee himself and go limp, and for him to stay on there like he's playing sort of king of the mountain, um, I, I, I think that the best thing that could have happened, and as I understand it, is uh, Mr. Chauvin has quite the tracking history of violence. Um, yeah, you know, 18, 18 complaints in 18 years is the number that I heard which averages and, to and, one complaint a year. So. And some of those and some of those are deadly force, correct? 
You know, what? I don't know, but but probably. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised given the nature of the George Floyd situation. Yeah, he'd had several deadly force complaints against him as well. So, you know, and again, it's it, we need to understand. And it, for me, it's it, I just need to be careful that I'm not too judgmental in the sense that not for him, for his sake, but for the sake of people that work in L.A. and New York. I mean, if you work in L.A., and I used to train with L.A. SWAT, and, and we used to do all kinds of tra- you know, training together and everything. And most of their guys had been to 20 shootings. And most of our, and as a team, we hadn't gotten 20 shootings, right? So, so, um, so depending where you're operating, you could, be, you could have been in several um, life and death scenario where you were forced to use lethal force. And that doesn't necessarily make you uh, a bad person. You know, obviously, you, you may be a, a, a consummate professional, but you were forced to use deadly force because you're working in South Central LA or you're working in New York or you're working in, in areas of town that are, you know, dangerous, right? Mm-hmm. So, but for him, there, there's also, an, there's additional pattern behaviors on there. All is, if I recall correctly, and I could, you know, I, let's just leave it out there. Like, I don't know for sure, but I do believe that most of his, fatal shootings were minorities right Mm -hmm. so again you know what is the area he works in and and what's predominantly there and all this stuff but i mean there there were quite a few quite a few uh red flags now what i will say is i listened to the union chief speak in in um in uh it's minnesota correct yeah yeah so i heard the union chief speak on several occasions and to me, um, he didn't come across like being the smartest tool in the shed. Um, a lot of the stuff he said w- was clearly indicative of the sort of the mentality of the union over there and how strong the unions are in the police forces in the U.S., especially in the U.S. Um, until, until three months ago, we as RCMP didn't even have a union. Right. But in the States, the, the unions are really, really strong. And they also have uh, a clause called qualified immunity. Right. And the qualified immunity is basically if you have been found not not criminally responsible for an action, you cannot be. It's really, really difficult to sue you uh, c- civilly. Right. When mm-hmm. in when. And so anyways. Um, so, yeah, I, I just. I don't see it happening. I, 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 I think that we have a, an individual with a tracking, an individual with a tracking history that displays sociopathic, if not psychopathic, not qualities, but trait, character trait. And, and, and I think that having him well-trained um, would, wouldn't have changed his makeup, right? Like, mm-hmm. so, so he may have been, he may have been better, but this may be causing additional issues. So mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. Well, let me ask you a question, Seb, here, um, because I think that everyone would agree that this was obviously an excessive use of force. What is interesting now is the public reaction and mm-hmm. response. You know, I've heard everything from the argument that, like, look, these are a few bad apples, a few isolated cases, right through to the other end of the spectrum where people are saying disband mm-hmm. the police force. And my concern as someone who likes to think of himself as somewhat rational <laughs> is that I, I don't want to, I would not want to see the public overreact in such a way that they make this problem worse than it otherwise would be. So for example, I mean, I, I think that it's, it's pretty clear that there are issues, especially, and again, this is me coming from the position as a, as a Canadian, right? I think it's pretty clear that there's issues with the way that the police force is structured in the United States. Clearly, there are some systemic issues that need to be resolved. But, and again, I'm not an expert, but it really feels to me like going the, all the way to the other side of the spectrum, which is to disband or defund the police force by some gigantic amount, I wonder, is that going to also create more problems than it solves? And it, it is understandable given that, look, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. Unemployment is at a high. Hundreds of thousands of people have died. I get that temperatures are pretty high right now, but I feel like the solutions that have been put forward onto a table might not actually solve the problem in the way that people think they would. And I'd be curious to get your thoughts on, like, where do we go from here if we really want to fix this problem going forward? Man, that is such a, it's such a complex 
set of circumstances and 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 I don't think that any one thing is going to do it. It's going to be a it's going to be a variety of different uh, reforms that will work together and it will take time and it will take money and it will take a lot of effort. Um, just to speak to um, the, you know, one of the points that you made in the beginning. So if you speak to uh, disbanding the police or let's not have them, um, 69, 1969 Montreal tried that. It basically turned into the purge. It actually made the purge look like a Disney movie. Um, you know, and you can look it up online. Basically, it took three hours flat. The police went on strike and they would not attend any call. And basically, the city was on fire, like immediately. Um, I think that most reasonable people understand that. Like, there are people out there that will prey on people as soon as they have an opportunity. They're opportunistic and they will be, and we've seen it even with COVID. We have people go to Costco and buy everything and then sell it for 10 times the price. What, what do you think that person does when there's no law enforcement, no, no, no charges, no yeah. arrest, no consequences, right? You can't trust that, but there is some merit to what's being tossed out. So the, the, the key here is um, if there is uh, what we refer to as uh, sort of systemic racism within the establishment, right? Or, or ins institutionalized racism. And I think what people don't understand, and some of the cops uh, are having an issue with that concept as well, is that that doesn't mean that every cop that's on the street is racist. In fact, it, it, it doesn't mean that at all. But what it does mean is somehow through history or through culture or entrenchment or whatever, there is a subconscious bias that is applied against a, a, a race or an ethnicity, right? Blacks, for example, in this case. Um, and so you may have a force that has all these people that are actually not racist. They have black friends, they engage in black community, they do all this stuff, but their organization has a deep rooted history of racism. And because of that, there is a subconscious bias that injects itself in there. Those are deep rooted. If you have a deep rooted uh, system like this, you have an entrenched culture. You know, people don't want to change or don't want to look inwards or don't want to don't want to have people coming in to snoop around and find out what's actually occurring there. Or you have a and a combination or a trifecta or a combination of, 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 of a very strong union where um, accountability is at an all time low. It's super hard to fire people, all this stuff. Yeah. Is this banding a bad idea? No, it's not. It's not. How you do it is, is what's critical, right? So if you're going to do that, and you're going you're gonna to bring another force in, whether it be, and I don't know how it works in the States. I, I know some of the inner workings, but not, very, not, not, not much. Um, but if you were to say, I'm going to you know, disband a small police force here, municipal police force, for example, and I will, I'm going to bring you know, the RCMP to cover or vice versa. Like I don't want to create a rift or anything. But, um, and, 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 and the calls will, and the emergency calls and the 911 calls will keep being responded to and all this stuff while we figure out the way forward, which is going to be, we are going to take this chief who's an incredible leader. He's, he's an ethical leader. He's a, he's a pillar of the community. We're going to bring him to this community and he will be in charge of rebuilding the police force from the ground up. That has had incredible success. It has. It actually did. It did in the States. It did in Canada and certain, certain departments. So, there's some merit there, right? Yeah, perhaps your, your department is so corrupt, viscerally, not necessarily that every officer is corrupt, as I said, but subconsciously, there's that negative bias, there, there's gender bias, there, there's, there's the race bias, or whatever the case may be, and we have such a deep-rooted history of, of, of this that we can't get out of it. Perhaps that's the only way out. Yeah, and that's, that's a really awesome point, and I'm so thankful that you brought that up, which is that there is a misunderstanding of what systemic issues mean. I think when people hear that there are systemic problems, they take that to mean that every person involved is a bad person, but that's not necessarily what it means. What it means is the system itself 
has a problem. It's not necessarily a judgment on the people involved, although it might be, but what it's really saying is that the process itself is where the problem is. And the challenge with fixing systemic problems is that there isn't one person responsible that you can hold accountable and blame, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and the problem is that human beings want things that way, where there is one person accountable. And that's why you see people who always look for explanations where there's a bad guy that they can hold accountable. But in reality, if you want to really fix a systemic problem, you need to come to terms with the fact that there might not be one person that solely is accountable for this. It could be the result of hundreds or thousands of bad decisions that have compounded on top of each other over the years to the point where even the people involved don't realize that there are problems there. I mean, a much more simple and easy to understand example are companies that put tremendous pressure on their sales team, for example. You know, they put crazy, crazy sales targets on people and they tell them, you're going to be fired if you don't hit this target right away. You know, when you create an environment like that and you suddenly start to encounter a lot of backstabbing and fraud, like, can you really be surprised? Mm -hmm. So yes, there are definitely people, and I think we've identified some people here who obviously are bad police officers and bad people and need to be held accountable under the law. But I think that just dealing with them is not going to be sufficient. I think we need to also go beyond and take a look at the systemic problems. And those are challenging, like you said, because there isn't just one place where you can point the finger. Yeah, exactly. And I think the, the first fix to any police force to look at reforms or, or the way forward and how we sort of switch things around and how do we change a culture is to have a honest self-assessment based on the history of that police force and understand that history forgotten is history repeated and make sure that everybody that comes through the police training understands what that police force has done historically, right? And, 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 and I'm going to throw it out there because I know people are thinking it. Look, the RCMP has had a, a, a shifty history with the indigenous. We took their kids, brought them to the, to the boarding schools. We've arrested them and moved them to uh, reservations so that we could give the land to white people. And, 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 you know, and the list goes on over the years. And yes, we're talking about 1873 and 1893 and 1904 and whatever. But the case, the, the fact of the matter is, is if I close my eyes and say, no, it, it, there isn't, there isn't um, a, a history of, 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 um, of discrimination. Um, I am running the risk of being part of the problem and that I don't recognize that there potentially is bias in, in, in organizationally, right? So one of the things I used to do with my guys, um, I would brief them once a year. We'd have the, when we had either the Indigenous Day or, or the Indigenous Week. And what I used to do is I used to print pictures of our CMP members sort of dragging kids over to boarding school. And I would put them on the table and I'd be, I want you guys to uh, uh, read the sort of the, there was a little narrative there, you know, kind of thing. And, 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 and it was, this was all approved by the sort of indigenous community. And I would have them go around the table and I would have them sign their name on it. So when I, when they returned it to me, every one of my guys had signed it. I had 24 guys at the time and they actually, and I knew that every single one of them understood. And then I would have a chat with them and my guys were obviously you know, top notch by way of selection and, and training and everything. So they were really, really good guys. But I used to tell them all the time, history forgotten is history repeated. You guys need to understand that those are the, some of the challenges that we face in the future because of the history. And those are things that we did. Don't think that we didn't do those things. We did those things, right? So, um, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I don't know if I went too far on a tangent, but, um, but when you start talking about uh, things such as defunding, let me tell you what the reality is for one. And, and Steve, just to sort of, uh, sort of segue in what you were talking about, uh, with respect to, um, to, uh, the interconnected pieces that we may not even be aware of. Well, sometimes we are aware of them. Sometimes police officers are banging their heads on the wall to tell, you know, crown or to tell, um, the courts or whoever, or social services or the doctor's office, like, look, you cannot release this guy. If you release this guy, he will kill someone. Next thing you know, 
you know, there's, there's loopholes in the system or whatever, and that guy goes out. That guy goes out and kills someone. Whose fault is it? And whose fault is it automatically is in the media? The cops, right? The cops didn't do anything. No, the cops actually lost sleep over the fact that he was trying to get that person remanded and kept in custody to protect the public, and that person was booted out, and now they reoffended, and now the cops are responsible for that, right? So those things are not always unknown. A lot of the times there are known. There are known uh, loopholes or known problems. The issue is everybody wants more with less money right? And that's no different for everybody. It's really, really hard. And policing is one of those things, man. If you do it right, nothing happens. And when nothing happens, you're not needed. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And this is a parallel that I see in a lot of, uh, you know, I talked earlier in the episode about, you know, goalie syndrome. And you see this in basically any job where the purpose of the job is to protect. You Mm -hmm. see this with police officers. You see this with IT people who deal with cybersecurity. Really, anyone whose job is to protect, people take them for granted because people, by Mm -hmm. definition, if those people do their job right, then nothing happens, right? Mm -hmm. Like by definition, Mm -hmm. Seb, if you do an amazing job, that means I should never even know that you exist. And that's part of what makes those jobs so difficult to do. Yeah, it's, it's, it's extremely difficult. It's extremely frustrating. Um, and, and, and also, it's, it's an interesting thing because here, here's what I think. You know, I think that police um, departments in general do a really poor job at communicating with the public. I, and, and I will say, I will quantify this by, or qualify this by saying um, some of the things that we see and deal with all the time perhaps isn't for the average Joe. And perhaps sometimes ignorance is bliss. And why would I share my PTSD? You know, I don't, I don't have it, but I'm just, you know, I'm just saying like some of these obviously very ugly things that we deal with um, uh, may not be for everyone. But what I will say is it's, it's likely to be a disservice for your police service. If you are not transparent with some of the things that are occurring, the good, the bad, and the ugly, you are going to have to justify your existence, right? Because I remember being on the team and I was in the, one of the busiest team in the country, if not the busiest team in the country. And we would have people, you know, oh, I, I, I didn't see this in the news and I didn't see that in the news and I didn't see this other call in the news. And when did you guys do that? And I'm like, well, you haven't seen 90% of my calls in the news. Yeah. You know, you have no idea. So it's really difficult after when, when somebody sees us walking around in green or with a, an armored vehicle that we use as cover or whatever the case may be, it's really hard for some people to wrap their mind around these guys are actually full time and they get called almost every day, right? But if we did a better job at communicating that, and, and there are some strategies that we're you know, working on to try to make that happen. But it's the same with all police departments, that, that culture of secret sort of let's not say anything, it's under investigation, just doesn't work. It never has. It never has. It never has worked for us. So yeah, we still have to be mindful of compromising investigation. And yeah, we have to be mindful of some of the sensitivity around certain files and around certain people and and privacy issues and whatnot. But we need to communicate better. We just do. Yeah. Uh, And do you you think, Seb, because, um, you know, in the discussion of defunding the police, I've heard multiple uh, positions. Like, for example, some people think the police need more funding. Some people think that we need to get rid of police altogether and in, uh, replace it with some sort of social, you know, officer or worker. Um, you know, some people think all cops are bad and some people think that the, the police needs to be defunded and, quote, demilitarized. Do you think that there's a mm-hmm. problem right now today with police being overly militarized? And I know that that's kind of a weird it's to me. It's almost like the term uh, military-style rifle when we're referring to rifles that aren't any different from a hunting-style rifle. It's just kind of one of those words, uh, but it basically just refers to, in my understanding, police officers that have, uh, you know, armored vehicles, high-caliber weaponry, and and things like that. When when shit really hits the fan. So, do you think that there is an issue where police are overly militarized nowadays? Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Let yeah, me just clarify uh, one more thing. And and I believe yeah. I believe the idea of mil- militarized police also uh, refers to cops being trained to see their uh, to see citizens as more 
uh, in times of aggression to be seen to see them more as enemies rather than uh, uh, rather than citizens. So instead of having the default of de-escalation, they use aggression. Mm-hmm. What's that saying? A society that separates its scholar from its warrior will have his thinking done by cowards and his fighting done by fools. That is precisely what I see. That it's like what it, what is the culture that you are trying to what is the culture that you are building in your organization, right? Do you have really, really smart people that are very compassionate, that have emotional intelligence, self-awareness, ownership, and, 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 and compassion? And, and then there are the risk, the, the, the high risk calls where they are going to need the tools to do the job, yeah. right? But it's, it, the issue is, so let's, let's separate these two issues a bit. So if you look at the states, for example, the United States have very different laws when it comes to arming police. A lot of the departments are allowed to actually use the funds, say if they seize $10,000 from a drug dealer, they can use that to acquire equipment, right? But then the issue isn't so much with the LAPD and the Miami-Dade that have their own SWAT team because they're dealing, remember, they have 360 million guns in this that we know of in the States. They own 80% of the world's arsenal and the propensity to use it is there and that's a massive difference, right? So if you have those kinds of weapons and if, say, uh, Matt, if, you're, if your brother, uh, Steve, was a cop and he's going on these calls where he's consistently coming, a, a, coming across a high-powered rifle and weapons, uh, military-grade weapons, can he bring a piece of cover with him, which, which is, is rescue vehicle might be? So it looks, oh, it's an armored car. It's not a tank. It's a piece of cover. Do we agree yes. on that? So, so the issue is, it, it, it is a few things. Um, in the States, the way to acquire military style equipment, it, there is like straight up uh, pipelines that will go, if this equipment is no longer serviceable or is the, if this equipment is, uh, is no longer needed and, it, and, and it's going to be evergreened, um, it can be sent to uh, you know, a, a police force somewhere. Now, the problem comes when that police force is a sheriff in Timbuktu that has a week long SWAT course and an attitude problem and military grade artillery, right? Mm -hmm. Now we have a serious problem. But inversely, if San Francisco SWAT has a professional team that, you know, trains consistently, that has a lengthy selection process, that has a lengthy uh, uh, training uh, course, like basic course and, and continuous training and continuous training on various areas, not just on weapons and tactics and shoot, move and communicate, but um, then it's a different story. Do you not need those guys? Yes, mm-hmm. you do. Do you need the Timbuktu sweat to have military grade artillery? No, you don't. Those guys are over militarized. Does that make sense? Context is everything, mm-hmm. right? So... With that, if you're talking about training. So again, that's a very interesting one because I watched a video not long ago of somebody that was criticizing uh, Dave Grossman. So Dave Grossman, um, I don't remember his full resume, but he was a Ranger Battalion commander and he, he's, a, he's actually a West Point professor. He's a psychologist. Uh, he, I believe he might have been a SEAL as well. Anyways, long story short, uh, this guy has, done, has written a book called On Combat and he's written a book, a book called On Killing. Right, and both of those books are specifically addressing uh, issues of lethal force encounters, and on combat really prepares somebody to basically use of lethal force when and if required. Right, so the idea um, that that is uh, and 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 politicians were all up in arm with doc, uh, Dr. Grossman's uh, sort of. Uh, uh, narrative or the way he spoke or whatever. My problem wasn't with what he said. My problem was that the context wasn't established properly is what I felt, right? So I was sitting in the audience and I'm listening to this and I understand exactly what he's referring to. He's referring to a lethal force encounter. I'm going to get in a gunfight. What is the attitude that I need to have once this happens, right? Or even preemptively to prepare so that I'm I'm not um, stalling or, or hesitating or whatever the case may be. 
But if you look at some people's faces, you could tell that, you know, oh, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. Not on the daily, Bob, right? Yeah, you have to have an attitude and yet, an attitude uh, that's conducive to survival and you have having a survival mentality and that includes being in shape and training properly and being a professional. But all those things are for the time in which you have no other choice than to save your life during a lethal force encounter mm -hmm. or, or take someone's life in protection of either yourself or others, mm -hmm. right? So there is a context to this. If you say, okay, let's take Dave Grossman completely out of that and let's not teach cops to do that. Instead, let's teach, let's teach them to be community-minded, to do this, to do that, which there is a, a, there is a ton of time for that. This should be the majority of their, of their training, really. Um, but the consequences of not having prepared for lethal force encounters has deadly consequences. If I'm not a good community cop, yeah, maybe I'm not just creating programs. Maybe I'm not playing, you know, soccer with the, 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 the kids or whatever. But likely nobody dies from that unless I have other problems. But if I'm, if I'm not prepared to use lethal force, if I'm not equipped to use lethal force, if I don't have the proper equipment when lethal force is used against me, I'm dead meat. But it's a very low occurrence, very high consequences. Low occurrence, high consequences. Those are the hardest to prepare for, mm -hmm. right? Well, in a situation where like, let's say there's a coup, let's say there's, uh, you know, gang violence on, a, on an insane level where you do need law enforcement to have, uh, you know, some pretty high powered uh, weaponry and 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 you need them to have that uh, that equipment i mean there's an argument for that and i i think that um you know like i'm i'm a law-abiding citizen and i've bought into the idea that the police are the arm of the government that enforces the law and law and order and uh you know that the reality is is that they'll do it by force and i've bought into that idea and um i support that so for me i'm not against the police having really powerful weaponry. That doesn't mean that I think they should uh, have that aggressive mindset where they see citizens as enemies or they go into uh, you know, a situation where there's protesting and see people as uh, enemies or, or whatever. I think that the, that, that culture mm -hmm. could be changed. But I also think that you know, I would rather my, my, uh, the, the cops that are who, who are protecting the society that I live in to have I mean, I guess I would say almost more firepower than too little. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'll take what you just said and segue into the defunding model, right? So you're absolutely right, Matt. And and and, but what happens is is, is this: the majority of police, uh, the police uh, departments, and I will I will speak to the to Canada, okay? The majority of police departments in Canada are grossly underfunded. Mm -hmm. Just simply, that is a reality, okay? And because they are underfunded, you have, what is the first thing to go? You want to be sustaining operations. So the first thing to go is training. Eh, not good, Yeah, that's, right? that's what we, if so, anything, so that's kind of what we need more of because, you know, if, we're, if especially if we're going to be imp implementing new practices and, and uh, you know, new culture and everything, like to me, mathematically, that, that means funding. And sorry to cut you off there. Yeah. Now, it's funny you bring that up, Matt, because I was just watching this Chris Rock bit this morning where he was talking about, um, you know, police violence. And one of the things he said is that, you know, being a police officer is one of the hardest jobs that you can do. And th these people are probably tremendously underpaid, but you get what you pay for. <laughs> and that's a great point, right? Because, you know, when you see a situation like this, now I am far from an expert on the matter, but it kind of feels like defunding might be a step in the wrong direction because it feels like really increased training and increased transparency should be the focus. And I don't know how to do that if the funding goes down. Well, yeah. Like if you want cops to learn jujitsu, I mean, that ain't free. You got there. The cops now have to either have some kind of, uh, government, you know, uh, selected trainer or program and that's going to cost money or the government will maybe cover the cost of a police officer to go to a jiu-jitsu school or an MMA school to learn how to, how to grapple or how to fight. So like, you know, especially when we look at the case of uh, George Floyd, when there was questionable, I mean, let's just call it downright wrong handling of, of someone's body and how maybe jiu-jitsu could have been 
uh, it could have provided a different outcome. You got to think, well, if you want cops to have these skills that take years and, and resources from somebody to teach them, it equals more funding than less. Yeah, you know, it's kind of an interesting, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll be really, really honest with you guys. And police officers, uh, and I can speak to our departments, I give them all the credit for these outfits being around, like period. I have seen so many, so many cops and files and high stakes files where the members are sleeping in their cars for four hours before going back on shift. And, you know, you talk to normal people, a 16 hour day is, is, a, is, a, one, is a once a year occurrence. I've worked back when the team, there was only 16 guys on, I've worked 41 hours consecutive. Like, ask anybody when was the last time. And on that, how many of those were spent in environments that are conducive to occupational stress injury? How much of that were you fearing for your life? How much of that was you having to use force mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in an incident? Like, I mean, yes, it's a tough job, but let's call a spade a spade. When people went into COVID, I didn't worry about what was happening with my paycheck when a lot of you did. And I, and I felt very strongly that I was fortunate that way, mm -hmm. right? Um, but, but yeah, so it, the, the funding model isn't, has some merit in that they, the police are doing too much. There's, you know, uh, uh, psychologists, they're plumbers, they're, you know, like whatever, like they're just taking care of a variety of, they're lawyers, they're doctors, they're, they're, you know, it just goes on and on and on and on. And they can't be all those things. They cannot. They, you know, they, they can't be animal control. They can't be, there's a variety of things. So you have to prioritize and execute. What do you want your police force to be doing and at what rate? And if you start spreading them too thin, you're going to get compromised product, right? So if you were to defund, but you were to do it in a, in a, in a control manner and actually reallocate some of those funds so that they could have assistance from the proper bodies responsible for the various areas. It's a different story. But the problem is then you are, are you actually defunding or are you needing more funds so that you can have the proper mo money in the proper place that should have been there in the first place that you never had. And now you're seeing the co consequences of that. Because that's a very different problem. I kind of feel like people are, always want a simple answer. And that's mm -hmm. understandable because there's comfort in simple answers. But mm -hmm. getting, getting to a simple answer, uncovering the kernel of truth, the thing that really matters, is often a very hard and ugly and complicated process. And I, one thing I've noticed, I mean, it's, it's been a rough few months, right? Like we've been, <laughs> we've been hit by kind of like a, a series of once in a lifetime crises, one after the other. And one thing that I've kind of noticed during this time is that people gravitate towards things that are certain and simple and easy to understand. And mm -hmm. in the face of an overwhelmingly complex problem, it's sometimes just, it's very comfortable to look for a solution that promises certainty or simplicity. And when I see this solution to just defund the police, I understand where it comes from. And there, I think it's to your point that you brought up earlier. I can see some merit to it. If you can identify certain districts that are just rotten to the core, but I think overall, you run the risk of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And that, that's really, I think, my biggest concern in this case is that the pendulum, which clearly needs to swing, I worry it swings so far back into the other direction that we exacerbate and create a different series of problems. I mean, I would think that to the points that we brought up earlier, increased funding, increased transparency, increased accountability, these would all be amazing things, but these things aren't free. Mm -hmm. Where are those funds going, right? And this is increasing accountability in terms of having police report exactly where the funds are going, how much trainings are the officer doing? Because I tell you what, if the public knew how much training officers are not getting in, in combatives or jiu-jitsu or whatever, they would have concerns, right? But what do they not know? How much training mm -hmm. we're not getting. Right. So, so if there's transparency there, they can say, Hey man, wait a minute. There's supposed to be some funds allocated for this. There's supposed to be some funds allocated for this. What are you guys doing? Don't reallocate those funds without permission. Take those funds and, and put them where they're supposed to be in de-escalation crisis in sensitivity training and, and have, you know, whatever the case may be, whatever the curriculum looks like. But with that, 
we have so much red tape at all levels of government in this country and in the U.S. as well, it is absolutely asinine. Trying to get anything done is just absolutely brutal, right? So we have, uh, you know, a justice system issue. We have mental health issues. We have, and everybody knows what those issues are. And we sit around and try to figure out solutions and there's no more money. And it's just, it is constant struggle to try to do so. Cases like this one, as unfortunate as it was, I don't disagree that drastic actions have to be taken at the time that we beat the iron while it's it's hot. Because if we don't, in six months, these guys won't remember a thing. And try to get fundings for some of those reforms will be absolutely impossible. It will be. So, so with that, if we decide to, to reallocate some funds and send them in other areas so that we can take the pressure off the police and keep them for criminal matters um, and community events or whatever, obviously, um, then how, how does that look like? If you take the money outright and, and next year, in, in next year's budget, we're cutting your budget by 120 million or by 10 million or whatever the case may be, depending on the size of the department. You are not implementing any of those solutions for the next five years, absolutely guaranteed, in terms of like getting them so that you have a return on investment, right? If you are to reform healthcare or mental health care, good luck. Like you're 10 years away from any substantial change, if not more, right? Even if you were taking drastic actions. But in that time, what you have is you continue to have a now even more so grossly underfunded. So now there has to be a prioritization that occurs. So now what, what does that mean? That means that training is being cut, officer numbers, which increases the risk, which decreases the efficiency, which increases the call volume, uh, sorry, increases the call response, decreases survivability, because maybe now in order for you to go to uh, an emergency to a call, it needs to be in progress and somebody needs to be dying. So that puts serious offenses on the back burner. Evidence is being, is being obviously discarded or, or, or uh, just fade away and, and you can no longer prosecute. Like, and the cops are now in the, st- the same stressful environment with less assets, less peers, less support, less training. How is that making anything better? that's just going to get absolutely catastrophically worse, right? So I, I think there is some merit to it. And if you, if you as, a, as, a, as an experienced officer, when I think of something and it absolutely uh, triggers a visceral reaction in me, it will generally sort of uh, prompt me to look deeper into this. Because change is hard for humans in general. It just, it just is. And if you've done things a certain way for 20 years, it, it viscerally, it hits you. So if I have a visceral response to something that somebody is suggesting, I will take a step back, take it home, look at it, dig deeper into it, try to know more before I viscerally answer. No, you can't defund police. We're all going to, you know, there, you just have to really, really be careful what you ask for here. That's all. Makes sense. Hey, Seb, um, we've been going for a while. Do you want to start wrapping this up or was there anything else you wanted to cover? Let me just think for a second because I guarantee you I'm going <laughs> to, I guarantee you I might. We can always have you back on. If you get a better damn headset. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll buy, I'll, buy, I'll buy another one if needed. I think it's been a pretty amazing episode, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, it's you know, dude, it's it's interesting. I'll tell you this from experience. Um, I, you know, especially when we start talking about things that people don't hear about in policing, I have never had anybody not listen, mm-hmm. right? Like people want to know. Yeah. There is they're yearning for information, and that's stuff that you generally don't get. And uh, and with me, you have the added bonus of there is zero BS in my answers. Like I will defend them to the death. You know, like I, I just. I just, I just don't give political answers. Like those are, those are actual, to the best of my ability, obviously, I'm not always, you know, um, perfectly on point, but, I, but I, I try to give the absolute most genuine answer that I can. And, I, and I've known you for, for years now, and uh, you're definitely one of the most genuine people that I've ever met. Uh, and, you know, using right and wrong and logic to, you know, to answer questions that I've ever had for you. It's never... It's never an emotional response or it's never, you know, uh, 
go, going overboard because of a certain belief. It's always straight down the middle and how you see it, which I really appreciate it. I think it's been good for the podcast. Yeah. And I also really appreciate that you're taking kind of like a nuanced measured approach on this matter and trying to understand things from all sides, but ultimately trying to bring things back to kind of like a, a rational conclusion, because I think that that kind of calm, experienced voice is something that really the world needs right now. I mean, everyone is kind of on edge for very understandable reasons, but I think that real solutions require clear thinking. And I really appreciate you giving voice to that here. I oh, appreciate it, boys. I'm super stoked you guys had me on. So, Well, Seb, I got a question for you. Normally, we wrap this up by doing plugs and begging our patrons for money. Uh, but as a, change <laughs> of, as a change of pace, is there anything in particular that you wanted to promote or anything that you wanted to plug? No, absolutely not. I, I just, if I, if, I, if I could add just one thing is if there are questions that you don't know the answer to, try not to make the answer to it. Instead, go to the source and try to get the information from somebody that doesn't jump the guns every time. You know, a question is asked in a volatile environment in, in the sense that emotions are running high, such as right now. Um, I would love to see people have the ability to have conversations and please, please, if you have family members or friends that you know the character of that are in the law enforcement community, try to cut them a break. This has been a really tough time for them. Try to cut them a break. If they're, if your own family turns on you, nothing worse than that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Awesome. Well, I think that was a fantastic chat, Seb. I would love to have you back. I think that our listeners probably will get a ton of value out of this. Um, I would just hope the next time you have an actual working computer and microphone so we don't have to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, Matt knows that I am like anal about audio quality, so it hurts my heart to have to release a Zoom call, but we will do it because I think this was a, a very important chat and I think it'll help a lot of people. Yeah. And I just want to say uh, thanks a lot, Seb, for being on the show. I think you gave us so much awesome information and insight into something that is so, uh, you know, it's so important right now to talk about and have these conversations about. And, uh, you know, you're a great guy uh, on and off the mats. You're a great law enforcement officer and great to chat to. Really appreciate you being on the show, man. Awesome. Thanks a lot, boys. Much appreciated. All right. Well, thanks a lot, guys. Really great chat. Talk to you next time. Take care. Yeah. Awesome. See you, boys.